I'd like to thank our very talented St. Thomas Idol and um, 2L Rebecca Duffield. I'm John Hernandez, the Assistant Dean for Student Affairs at St. Thomas University School of Law. I would this time like to invite to the lecture in this year's Juris Doctor Valedictorian, Carrie Nirenberg. <laughs> Mr. Nirenberg is a graduate of the University of Central Florida. Since his first semester at St. Thomas through his entire three-year career, he has consistently proven a commitment to academic excellence that culminates today in his graduating first in the class. I present to you Carrie Nirenberg. Well, class of 2012, we finally did it. And I think I can speak for all of us when I say, wow, what a wild and crazy ride. Three years worth of blood, sweat, and tears. And now the day has finally arrived where we can sit back, relax, and enjoy our accomplishments. Finally, no more law school exams. Three years ago, I would often wonder, what is it that separates the top law schools in the country from all the others? I figured it had to be some type of secret teaching method or superior technology, but no, that's not the case. I've come to realize that law schools are really nothing more than buildings with really, really uncomfortable chairs. And all law schools use the same teaching methods and similar case books, so what is it that separates one law school from another? Where do these rankings come from? The truth is, a law school is only as great as its student body and its faculty. It's the people inside of these really uncomfortable buildings that truly make a difference. And that is why I know that St. Thomas Law School is headed in the right direction. This graduating class of 2012 is filled with so many promising futures, so many good people with such capacity to do great things. This is truly an exceptional group, and the sky is the limit for our futures. And this is our day today. It's one that we will always remember for the rest of our entire lives. It is also a day to recognize and thank our families and our friends who made all of this today possible. We all have many people to thank who helped us along the way, and today is the day that we get to stop, reflect, and recognize that we never could have made it this far without their help. I'd also like to give a special thank you to my professors who spent an unreasonable amount of time answering all of my obsessive compulsive questions before exams. You certainly know who you are. Many times I would take up countless hours of their free time just waiting for them to kick me out of their offices and tell me to get lost, but no. These professors didn't do that. They were always willing to put in the extra time and make sure that I truly understood the material. And I think that's one of the aspects of St. Thomas that really makes it great and really makes it unique. Most of the faculty and professors are so accessible and they genuinely care about helping us realize our full potentials. I cannot thank you enough for your time and your hard work and I will never forget that you were always willing to go the extra mile. Now, I know I said there would be no more exams, but let's not forget, there is one more exam yet to be conquered. That's right, of course, the bar exam. And I agree, the mere thought of taking another test at this point puts me practically on the verge of tears. Okay, but we need to also look at the bar exam as an opportunity. It's a chance for us to prove that St. Thomas belongs in the upper echelon of law schools. Earlier this year, St. Thomas had the highest bar passage rate in the entire state of Florida. And in July, we have the opportunity to prove again that St. Thomas Law School is on the rise and I think we can turn a few heads in the process. 
we have the chance to show how great we really are. After all, a law school is only as great as its students. I cannot wait to see what we can all accomplish for ourselves, for our families, and for each other. No matter what we decide to do with our degrees, I know that we will use them wisely. And perhaps Abraham Lincoln said it best, whatever you are, be a good one. Today, Honest Abe can rest in peace as there are so many good ones, so many great ones sitting here among us today, getting ready to make a real difference in society. Class of 2012, I want to thank you so, so much from the bottom of my heart for three great years that I will never, ever forget. And I am so proud to be a part of such an outstanding group of young professionals. And finally, I'd like to make one last thank you to my parents, mom, dad. I just want you to know that uh, none of this would be possible without you. And uh, I can't thank you enough. And uh, as I conclude, I would like my fellow graduates to please join me in a standing ovation, not only to celebrate our great achievements today, but also to thank and applaud our families and our friends who made the sacrifices that were necessary to get us to where we are today. Thank you, and God bless. Thank you, Mr. Nirenberg. It's now our pleasure to recognize two students. Will Tally Gilmore and Kyle Teal please come up on the stage? Tally is this year's recipient of the Pro Bono Volunteer and Public Service Award. Tally received her undergraduate from Kent State University. While at St. Thomas, she has served as the managing editor of the Intercultural Human Rights Law Review and been active in the International Law Society. She wins this award today for her outstanding commitment to our pro bono volunteer legal services program in which she provided over 504 hours. 232 of those hours were for UNICEF Panama where she did research into the documentation for a project designed to protect children and deter them from gang related activity and 272 hours at the American Red Cross where she did research into the organization's humanitarian law curriculum, which helped implement the program into local schools and worked with attorneys to implement a veterans court in Miami. Please join me in recognizing Tally Gilmore. Now, my pleasure to present another special award. The American Law Institute and the American Bar Association Section on Professional Education authorizes each law school to recognize one student with its scholarship and leadership award. Our 2012 awardee is Mr. Kyle Teal, a graduate of Florida State University where he majored in English and psychology and served as a student senator Mr. Teal worked as a reporter and TV anchorman in Key West before joining our law school community. While in law school, he has served as a certified legal intern for the Miami-Dade Public Defender's Office and worked as a summer associate and law clerk for the Coral Gables Law Offices of Trescott and Drucker and Brigham Moore. 
Mr. Teal served as editor-in-chief of our highly regarded Law Review, leading our recent symposium on law and the media, and was a member of our award-winning moot court teams, competing in the ABA National Appellate Advocacy Competition and the Florida Bar's Robert Orsek Memorial Competition, and coaching our San Diego National Criminal Procedure Team. In addition, he has been involved in a variety of community service programs, helping the underprivileged and those new to our country. Please join me in congratulating him as well. What makes this school special, as Mr. Nuremberg said, is, is the way we have so many students who step up to make us better, to make our school better, make our community better. <clears throat> there are literally dozens of you that I would like to recognize with special awards. <clears throat> but as they cross the stage today to be hooded, <clears throat> I'll be presenting Dean's Awards for Outstanding Leadership and Service to three people, each of whom has contributed in several different ways to our public service, to our moot court, mock trial, law review programs, and to our relationships with the bench and bar. <clears throat> I would ask Joseph Hunt, Shannon Healy, and Jennifer Heath to briefly stand that we may recognize them for their work as well. On behalf of our law school community, I'd like to thank all of our law school student leaders and volunteers for all the ways you have made this a better school. Uh, as Mr. Nirenberg said, you are an exceptional group, all of you. It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce our commencement speaker, <clears throat> the Honorable Rosemary Barquette, United States Circuit Judge for the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Burkett has had a distinguished career of public service. Before being nominated by President Clinton and confirmed to her current position on the 11th Circuit, she served as Associate Justice and then Chief Justice of the Florida Supreme Court, the first woman to have served in either of those positions. Prior to that, she was Chief Judge of Florida's 15th Judicial Circuit and an appellate judge on the 4th District Court of Appeal. <clears throat> she served in private practice in West Palm Beach, Florida, before <clears throat> becoming a member of the judiciary. Judge Barquette is a summa cum laude graduate of Spring Hill College and a graduate of the University of Florida Law School, where she received the J. Hillis Miller Award as the outstanding graduate. Judge Barquette has been widely recognized for her service, her leadership, and her commitment to justice. She has taught and lectured around the world and has been a faculty member for the National Judicial College. She's been a strong advocate for justice, for public education, <clears throat> for legal aid for the poor, and especially for child welfare and the protection of children in our legal system. <clears throat> Her leadership in these areas has resulted in a list of awards, commendations, and appointments that are too numerous to mention. <clears throat> Just to note a few, the American Bar Association Commission on Women in the Profession presented her with its Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Award. She received the Latin Business and Professional Women Lifetime Achievement Award. She was inducted into the Florida Women's Hall of Fame and was the National Association of Women Judges Honoree of the Year. Each year, the Florida Association of Women Lawyers presents the Rosemary Barquette Outstanding Achievement Award to an outstanding lawyer and the Academy of Florida Trial Lawyers in recognition of Judge Barquette's commitment to justice presents the Rosemary Barquette Award each year to a person who demonstrates outstanding commitment to equal justice. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker and thanking her for her leadership and public service.
Thank you very much. I'm going to try really hard <clears throat> to see to it that my uh, address will not last as long as that very generous introduction, <laughs> Dean Wright. Thank you. On the other hand, it won't be as short as Winston Churchill's. And Churchill was a man who understood the nature of commencement speeches. <clears throat> By custom, the occasion calls for a speaker. You have to have a graduation speaker. But the audience, subliminally, maybe not so subliminally, calls for a very brief speaker. When Churchill was asked to speak at a graduation, <clears throat> For those who might not know the story, he approached the podium with his famous cigar clenched in his teeth. He took the cigar out of his mouth and he set it firmly on the podium and he looked at the young graduates in front of him with his very steely eyes and he said, never give up. He then paused, he gripped the podium, he picked up his cigar, he gave a sweeping glance again at the graduates and he thundered a little louder, never give up. The third time, <clears throat> he looked again, paused, leaned into the microphone and said a third time, never give up, and then went and sat down. Now, obviously, I cannot do that, first, because I don't smoke cigars. But second, if there's anything that you've uh, learned in law school, <clears throat> it's that you cannot give a lawyer an opportunity to speak and then expect them not to take advantage of it. <laughs> so if you will indulge me, let me spend a few brief moments on this pretty terrific occasion uh, and talk to you about a couple of things that are on my mind. I really want to talk to you about many, many things. If I could, what I really would want to do is to have one of these Vulcan mind melts and take all of the graduates and put so much uh, into, into your heads and into your hearts. But I can't do this, so I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about a few things, uh, starting with congratulating you and your parents, friends, significant others on your singular achievement today. Now, I do not happen to believe that the profession of law is any more noble than that of a carpenter or a teacher or a doctor or a plumber. Every profession or every occupation serves a need in our society, and whatever their occupation or their profession, everyone has the same moral obligation, I believe, to deal fairly and to perform to the best of his or her ability, observing the ethics peculiar to that particular profession of or occupation. It is not your profession or occupation that makes you a better human being. But being a lawyer does require you to do more than most in that to be a lawyer, you must publicly articulate and publicly commit to abide by the standards and ethics established by your peers in the profession, requiring you to take a lawyer's oath as a condition of practicing law. Now, because you recite this oath when you are sworn into the bar at a time of hurry and excitement, I, I wanted to take a couple of minutes today to briefly reflect on some of those provisions in the hope that when you do recite it, either in a small ceremony or a large one among your peers, you will repeat it knowingly, thoughtfully, and with a real sense of commitment and give you much more of an insight into what it means to be a lawyer. It means, among other things, that you are going to swear to maintain the respect due to courts of justice and judicial officers and to abstain from all offensive personality. And trust me, this is going to be very hard at times, for your patience will be sorely tried on many occasions, first by other lawyers, and beyond the obligation of the note on a practical level, let me observe that as in life, being abusive to an adversary is very seldom effective. Second, with respect due to judges, let me make a couple of observations. First of all, that judges you will find are like any other group, a mixed bag. You will find some likable, some not. 
some bright and some not so bright. Uh, the respect, though, however, that we are talking about that is due to a judicial officer is accorded to the position, to the system that posits the judge as the neutral and the fair arbiter of disputes, the disinterested power that stands between the state and its citizens. Your respect is owed regardless of the individual characteristics of the judge. And on behalf of the judges that you will be meeting in your work, don't be fair, unfair to them in your expectations, for they are no more or less perfect than any other group of human beings. You will also swear not to counsel or maintain any suit or proceeding that seems unjust, nor use any defense except one that you honestly believe is debatable under the law. Now, as lawyers, I think sometimes we become insensitive to how traumatic a lawsuit can be to a layperson, and you cannot subject someone to such a process unjustly. The frivolous, the unfounded lawsuit, the use of process by you or your client as a bludgeon or a club when there is truly no legal basis is despicable, it's unfair, and it's wrong. You also swear to propose no defense except that which is honestly debatable. Now, surely you don't need to be told that you cannot put a witness on the stand to lie. But many situations are not really all that clear cut. You're going to have to wrestle with the concept of what is honestly debatable under the law of the land and resolve conflicts in light of your own integrity, your own moral sense, be prepared for some hard moral choices so that you won't let something sneak up on you and impel you to take a course of action which you would never have chosen if you had given it a little thought. You will swear that in every case you will employ such means only as are consistent with truth and honor and will never seek to mislead the judge or jury by any artifice or false statement of fact or law. Now that really needs no comment except to note from a practical point of view that your effectiveness as an advocate is drastically diminished when you misrepresent a fact or a case and not only with a judge or members of the legal community, because as I have said, judges are no different than anyone else. And reputation spreads in the halls of justice as well as in the halls of schools, corporate buildings, and legal offices. More importantly, Truth and honor is what the system is all about. An adversary system such as ours is designed so that truth will emerge, and the underpinnings of that system demand integrity of the adversaries. Don't forget that you will also be promising to maintain the confidence and reserve inviolate the secrets of your clients. And that means from your spouses, from your significant others, from your friends, from luncheon and cocktail party conversations. Your clients tell you in many instances what they would only tell their rabbis, their priests, or their ministers. And even if it's a trivial matter, it is not your story to tell. The next phrase I fear from reading transcripts is unfortunately very much ignored. You will be swearing to advance no fact prejudicial to the honor and reputation of a party or a witness unless it's required by the justice of the cause with which you are charged. The legal process is unique in that it requires, in many instances, a significant intrusion into the private lives of others. Our discovery rules and practices in an effort to discover truth permit a very wide latitude in exploring not only the private lives of parties, but also of witnesses who many times have only a peripheral involvement in a lawsuit. You have an ethical obligation not to abuse that process, to submit parties or worse, witnesses, to questions that have absolutely no bearing on the issue or on their credibility, or to attack and destroy a witness on the stand, for those of you who will be litigators, with irrelevant evidence just simply to assuage your ego violates your oath. And ultimately, you will also publicly acknowledge that you will never reject the cause of the defenseless or oppressed or delay any man's cause for lucre or for malice. Delay, of course, when there's no good cause, results in a disservice. 
a disservice to the individual litigant whose life is on hold pending the outcome of a case, and a disservice to society in general by needlessly overloading the system. And regardless of whether you believe that other professions are obligated to do pro bono work or not, you are taking an oath to never reject the cause of the defenseless or the oppressed for lucre or for malice. You will have many opportunities to respond to this obligation in many ways. And because you're a graduate of St. Thomas Law School, I trust I need to say no more, as I have seen by the examples set by the students who have done so much pro bono work before they've even become lawyers. The rest of you don't close your eyes to the opportunities. Finally, and in reverse order, because the first provision of the oath is to swear to support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Florida. One deals with a sense of community and the other an understanding of pluralism. You're swearing allegiance to two separate constitutions, which are similar in part, but also dissimilar or provide different protections and benefits to its citizens. Obviously, the federal constitution provides the floor of protections from the overreach of government in our pluralistic society. But the Florida constitution, as do other state constitution, provides additional protections and benefits to its citizens, which clearly should not and cannot be ignored and which I hope you will keep in mind. For example, Florida's constitution requires the state to provide a full and adequate education to its citizens. Specifically, it provides in no uncertain terms as a constitutional benefit, quote, that the education of children is a fundamental value of the people of the state of Florida and a paramount duty of the state to make adequate provisions for the education of all children residing within its borders. As for our federal constitution, we in the legal profession are special guardians of the constitutional protections enshrined in our Bill of Rights. It guarantees that those freedoms that make this country unique will be protected. This country, which was built on a concept of pluralism, a belief that government could be established for one primary purpose, and that is to protect each person's equal rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The framers <clears throat> wanted to guarantee to us the freedom to, stink, to think, to speak, and to disagree. Um, however, the constitutional freedom to disagree encompasses the concept that you must think your own thoughts. Don't accept labels. Don't think you know what lies behind the packaging without finding out for yourself. We all love slogans. We have a hard time living them. We believe in justice and equality for all. But in this country, that means accepting that others who think differently and hold different values are entitled to the same protections of freedom. Our pluralism requires open-mindedness, tolerance, and patience. The search for truth demands that we avoid and reject an atmosphere hostile to the absolute freedom to think and the freedom to express those thoughts and engage in open, free, and robust discussion. It is criticism and it is the resultant debate that will always be the spurs to reform, to improvement, and to prog progress. But debate inherently means thoughtful views. It means that before debating, we revert to the game that we all played as children. Irrespective of our intellectual abilities, our gender, our religion, our race, our sexual orientation, our, national, our nationality, or any other differing characteristics, the one game that we all had in common when we were children was the why game. You have to go to bed. Why? Because you need to sleep. Why? So you'll be alert in school. Why? Uh, we are no longer children, but I beg you to revert to your childhood in this regard, except that now we are the ones that are going to have to provide some answers. Why did you want an education? To acquire knowledge? 
Why? To obtain information? Why? Of what use is it just to have it? Then why? To convert it into understanding? Why? So we can use it? Why? To make money? Why? To make life better for ourselves and for our families. And if making money for ourselves and our families isn't making life better for us, then why make it? To have power. Why? What to do what? And I'm sure you get the idea. I suggest to you it is a game that has to be played as an adult in every context, sometimes with surprising results if one is honest with oneself. Every time I give a speech, I try to find a way to insert the observation of an old Alabama judge who used to say that the trouble with the world ain't what people don't know, it's that most of what people know ain't so. All too often, what we think we know is something we have simply accepted because somebody said so because we ourselves have not examined and evaluated the evidence to reach our own conclusions. Justice Blackman spoke one year at the University of Miami Law School and rhetorically played my why game. He said, what have I learned? That question leads to others. Learned about what? About human nature? About law? That feet today are indeed made of clay? That life is or can be cruel? that man's inhumanity to man still prevails, that life itself is controversy, that we are still an intolerant society. Myriad questions present themselves and answers are elusive. He said, I think the answers are elusive mostly because we never stop long enough to think of why we are doing what we do. Today, as we gather to celebrate your law school graduation, it's a good time to ask why we are really here you and your families have spent an enormous amount of money and time and sacrifice to receive your law degree. We, as a society, have invested billions of dollars in our educational system at every level. Why? To plant a building like this in the landscape? Clearly, an aspect of our legal education is to acquire professional knowledge and skills, and those professional skills will contribute in some measure to meeting the financial needs of ourselves and our families. But if that's all we do in educating ourselves and our young people, that's not enough. Obviously, every educational institution would like to inculcate and encourage the thoughtful scholarship, which would place it in the company of the really great academic institutions in this country. But if it, that's all they do, that's not enough. We are faced today with all of the problems humanity has ever faced, and perhaps in an even more complex pattern than ever before. The solution to these problems that humanity begets is a lifelong quest, and it is that quest, I hope, which is driving your desire to learn. Why are we lawyers? Not simply to know things, but to do things. Well, what things? To answer that question, we must ask why we have laws or courts of justice. I hope you play the game in the same enduring and persevering way you did as a child, asking it again and again until the chain of whys yields an answer that will satisfy you. You have joined the ranks now of a unique group of people, people who have hopefully been trained to see in a clearer, more dispassionate and comprehensive way and these skills will enable you to see better the injustice when it occurs, the inequality or the unfairness, which seems to be always a part of life. More importantly, you have acquired the skills to do something about it. Some of these skills will serve you well in playing the Y game on the broader field of life and improving it, not only for yourselves, but for all of us. I am hopeful that the answers which are going to be provided by this 2012 class of caring, thoughtful people will deliver on the promise of the values that we here all share. We still have poverty. We still have inequality. We still have crime. We still cannot live in peace with people with whom we differ. I hope you ask and continue to ask why, 
and I hope that the skills that St. Thomas Law School has provided to you will enable you to do something about it, and I hope that you then remember Winston Churchill's admonishment to never give up. Thank you.